I'm Sonia Morton Firth and you're tuned in to the Sonia Morton Firth Show. Today, my guest is Dr. Jude Curavan, cosmologist, author, and planetary healer. We discuss the nature of our universe, what is conscious evolution, and whether we are on the verge of a paradigm shift. Jude, thank you so much for being a guest on my show. Welcome. It's lovely to see you today. Thank you, Sonia. It's my great pleasure. We we met last year. It's been taking a while for us to sort this out, but I'm so glad and grateful to be together today. Oh, well, Jude, so am I. And it's good, good that we actually made it happen. Jude, I just want to go straight in there and ask a big question, and that mm-hmm. is, what is your superpower? Oh, curiosity. <laughs> I think curiosity because it keeps me going. It's been my lifelong journey of asking, as my mum would tell you, my favourite word when I was a little girl and it's been ever since is why, 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 why? And that curiosity has really invited me and kept me on an incredible adventure the whole of my life. So. Well, I love that curiosity. I, I've got to say, I, I do share that as well. Um, and so let's be curious now. Could you <laughs> tell my audience a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are today? How long have we got? Well, <laughs> mm, <laughs> about an hour. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll then I'll really summarise this. Well, we were talking before we came online that we were both brought up in the north of England. Yeah. You write up in the north and me in Derbyshire, which is more Midlands really, but it uh, it's a coal mining area. And my dad and granddad were coal miners, so I come from a coal mining family. Um, from a very early age, about four, I began having what variously called supernormal experiences, paranormal experiences, supernatural experiences. For me, they were just supernormal because I I started so early that for me to have precognitive dreams and and see auras and all of that, which I'm sure we'll explore a little bit later, was just a natural part of, of my life. And of course, what it also did by my walking between worlds, literally from that very early age, my experience of the nature of reality was, I suspect, quite different from the folks that um, I was aware of around me. Uh, you know, we're very down to earth in a coal mining com- community. Um, but here I was, and I wasn't sharing it with anyone, but I, other than um, discarnate beings that were accompanying me and inviting me and walking alongside me on this journey. So this has been an intrinsic part of my life long experiences. But I was also then curious from those experiences why I wasn't being taught about that in school. Because what I was being taught in school was very different. It was of a universe that is just this physical plane and a universe that really is full of separate stuff. And that wasn't what I was experiencing. So anyway, I got very fascinated by science and trying to find why science wasn't telling me what I was experiencing. So quantum physics at a very early age. And what I was finding then is it wasn't the education or the community that I was growing up in or the society I was growing up in, but I was I was found my way to ancient wisdom. And especially the ancient wisdom of ancient India and ancient Egypt. And the teachings from those times, and especially the, 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 the writings that we still have, um, especially from India, were describing reality far closer, far more aligned with what I was experiencing. And what they were basically saying is that mind and consciousness aren't something we have, that what we in the whole world are. So I was on this journey of ancient wisdom. I was on this journey of, of those discoveries of science and my own experiences. And then I went to university and did the master's. And then I went into international business and had 25 years in that. And then I left that. And then I did a PhD in archaeology, and then I became an author, and then I became lots of other things as a healer and lots and lots. So it's a very scenic route. But what I've realized is something that the Danish philosopher uh, Kierkegaard said. He said, we live life forwards and we understand it backwards. 
So I now have an understanding of why my route has been so scenic to this point, because I hope I can serve others from this understanding and help others from this understanding of every step taken in my own journey. Wow, Jude, um, so much to ask you. Um, During your, well, well, first of all, when you were a little girl, you said you started seeing um, or or realizing you were different and and having these auras. Could you go into that a little bit deeper? Mm -hmm. I'm happy to, but I wouldn't say I was different. I was just saying my experience was different from people around me. But what I've realized as I grew up and ever since is that we all have these natural attributes. They're part of who we really are. You know, so as a cosmologist whose curiosity is about the nature of reality in our universe, you know, I I, I, I write now and I, I share this understanding, this evidence based that our universe exists and evolves as a, a unitive entity of, of mind and consciousness. And so we're all able as little cells, little microcosms in that vastness to have access to its universal wisdom and universal experience. It's just that as human beings, and you know this very well, our societies, especially in our secular societies in in the West, have really shut us down. We shut ourselves down to that wider openness and awareness of, of these deeper realities. So yes, it was hearing discarnate voices in my head, But these were wise voices, these were kind voices, these were loving voices, and they invited me to explore. And they always, always said to me, you're not special. (laughs) Don't think you're special. (laughs) In a loving way, it's a loving, as my mum would have said, if she'd have known, get over yourself. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. That's a very northern expression. It's a very northern expression, expression, isn't it? But so, that, was a, that was a journey, so many different types of phenomena. And I guess now when I'm asked these sort of questions, and I, I will happily share them, but I also say sometimes mainly the door into this adventure is just being aware of our intuition because our intuition is our superpower and we all have it. We just maybe tapping, don't listen to it. And sort of tapping into that. Well, let, let's go there a little yeah. bit, Jude, because... Um, I, I love the topic of intuition, um, and and I and I have been trying to tap into my own intuition. But I I think um, various times in our life we become very disconnected mm-hmm. um, to that, and I, and I think well I believe our society sort of disconnects us as well, uh, and it's sort of becoming more in how would you suggest people really sort of tap into their intuition and and listen to their heart or their soul or i think you just said it so beautifully it's listening to our heart listening to our soul listen to our gut you know the microbiome you know is 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 incredibly wise you know we talk about a gut feeling well that's there's body wisdom there and if we actually come out of our heads and I, I'm not decrying our minds. They're wonderful, wonderful things. But when they're the driver for us, we can tend to put to one side perhaps the deeper wisdom of our hearts and our souls. Because our minds are incredibly clever. But in my experience, they're, they're more clever than they're wise in many ways. Until we get to a point where we, you know, we do listen to ourselves, our inner voice, and then trust it and follow it and get out of the way of the word should Uh or it shouldn't be like this or it should be like that whatever yeah it's it's deepening our willingness really our openness and our willingness to trust ourselves because Uh when we do that it 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 sort of doesn't it, it we take a journey from here to here and that's an incredibly important journey for us all to take and then we can come back and integrate but if we're staying in here we don't trust our intuition, we don't follow it. And we, I would suggest, miss out on a huge, wondrous adventure of life. Absolutely. So going back to sort of your journey, um, you mentioned the word cosmology, you were a mm-hmm. cosmologist. Can you define what cosmology actually is? It's seeking to understand the nature of our universe 
would be probably the answer that most cosmologists would give. I would take it a step further than that, because we now know that we have the evidence that the appearance of our universe, its energy and matter, its space and time, is real, but it's not its fundamental reality. It's not the nature of its underlying reality. It's its appearance that arises from deeper levels of causation. And those are levels of causation of consciousness and cosmic mind. So for me as a cosmologist, I would say to understand the nature of reality at the deepest sense. Right. Okay. I'm going to sort of delve into that a little bit more. So when you say the nature of reality, um, and if I think of what I was taught back in the day, a few years, well, many years ago, <laughs> and science tells us the universe, or, or, or and, and I'm, when I say science, I mean it meant the science back in the day, and I know things are changing now. Um, the universe started with this sort of this this big bang, mm -hmm. um, and then it was sort of made of, of atoms and molecules and all the rest of it, and uh, you know planets were formed, galaxies were formed, etc. Um, are you, where does that theory and say the new, I want to say new science, but I'm probably getting my words wrong, but the, the, the science that you talk about, how does that differ? It's just bigger and deeper in a sense, because, you know, 20th century science was founded on incredible discoveries that when we delved smaller and smaller and smaller scales to what's called the quantum world, things didn't seem to be the same as our macro world. Yeah. So that yeah. started to open a door into a possible new understanding of reality. And of course, when Einstein also realized that, you know, space is relative to an observer, time is relative to an observer, but he did something better than that. He did something more than that. He realized we had to bring together space and time into something called space time. So 20th century science built on what had gone before and expanded it. But some of the deeper realizations and implications of the discoveries weren't accepted into the mainstream. And those deeper implications were that the energy and matter that quantum physics describes and the space time that relativity physics describes were describing something that of themselves weren't the deepest level of reality. That when we dug even deeper, we realized that all the separate objects that we thought we knew actually aren't separate at all and they're not objects instead they're they're relationships they're relationships and they're relationships as we now realize of information meaningful information they're not the solidity that we thought we knew so even us as as humans um we're, we're literally information we're information we're the information. whole world is information but i always stress the meaningful nature of it mm -hmm. i put a little hyphen between in and formation cosmic information universal information literally in forms the forms of our universe you me leaves atoms molecules and it does so from a scale that is as tiny as to an atom as an atom is to the whole universe. It's rather, if you think about it, I mean, what is lovely, what I feel, find absolutely great is that back in the day when quantum physics and relativity physics were, were coming forward and all these deeper understandings and perceptions were being shoved to the side, they focused on technology. And that technology over that next hundred years or so has brought us to where we are today. Mm. But our digital, te our technologies have allowed us to see further out in the universe than never before, smaller than ever before. But also our technologies, the, the digital technologies that we're having this conversation thanks to, have almost predisposed us to what we're now discovering about the universe. Because our technologies are digitized informational technologies. Our universe is digitized informational reality. Yeah. But it's almost like our mind, because my mind, I'm, I'm listening to you and my mind, and, and I'm, I'm very conscious of, of, of my observations. I'm trying to make logic sense of, of what you're saying, which is 
very difficult because we're told one thing and not another. Yet my intuition resonates with what you say, if that makes sense. I can feel it. It makes enormous sense. And people have been saying that since, you know, I came out with a book called The Cosmic Hologram in 2017. Mm. And then my fine, my last book, it's not my final book, I hope, but my, my latest book is The Story of Gaia in 2022. Oh. Both of those share the evidence at all scales of existence across many different fields of research for this understanding. Of course, this understanding speaks to us at such a deep level. And it also converges with universal wisdom teachings. The old science of materialism and separation had no place for love. It had no place for intuition. It had no place for spiritually based and universal wisdom teachings. This new understanding where mind and consciousness aren't what we have, as I mentioned, they're what we and the whole world are, converges with those. It brings us home, it seems to me. It brings us home to a remembering of who we really are. And where is home and who are we really? I would suggest that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And in that human experience and also as spiritual beings, we are microcosmic co-creators of our universe. And we've forgotten that we are this. When we remember this and we remember and we wake up from the illusion of separation, it seems to me that the universe is inviting us to do this and to consciously evolve to become its and our planetary home's co-evolutionary partners. What an amazing adventure to be invited into. I'm I'm, I'm smiling and this this is really resonating with me Um, quite recently or or over the last few months. I had a a spiritual experience um, with plant-based medicine called ayahuasca and everything you have just said, I saw. (laughs) I had the most tremendous, and look, I'm I'm not a scientist. I wouldn't say I'm the most intellectual of people. My brother got all the brains. (laughs) So intellectually, my mind is trying to get around it. It doesn't need to. But what I saw and what I felt and what my intuition feels, which is why I now lead, so try and lead by my intuition is, I saw, I saw yeah. love, connection, the universe. Um, I sat in one spot and I had so many things sort of thrown at me that would just, I could see our energies all merge into one. Um, and the realization that our breath, and this was really fundamental, it was the first thing that I saw was our source of, that was our life force yes. and how powerful the breath was. But I, I this, this is going to sound very strange, but I even traveled in time, time and space. Welcome, with- welcome to my world. <laughs> Uh, but I was obviously under the, you know, I'd had, I'd taken the, the ayahuasca um, and I've been trying to decipher the journey ever since. Um, mm. And all I can say is I saw f- the fifth dimension. Mm. Could you explain that to me? And, and I don't know if this is going to take my mind into a different place. But the, the way I saw it was we are all in the same, we're in different times and different places, but all at the same time. Let me try and unpick that a little yes, bit. Yes. Okay. And, 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 and perhaps we can take a step back into the breath because what I started to write about in the Cosmic Hologram and then in the story of Gaia was to, to reframe the beginning of our universe. As you mentioned, Sonia, we, we're taught at school, you know, it began as a big bang. And we know that it wasn't big. It was a, a sort of a, a bit of a joke, that it was tiny, but that a bang, you know, this sort of sense of chaos and all the rest of it. We now know that was absolutely not the case. The opposite was the case. Yes, it began in its most tiny state, but it began exquisitely fine-tuned and ordered. And that is vital because without that ordering and that exquisite fine-tuning, of its forces and its relationships, it would not have been able to exist and then to evolve from that initial simplicity to ever greater levels of complexity 
What was that initial simplicity? That well, that initial simplicity was atoms of in, after a few minutes or a few moments, atoms of hydrogen and some helium, a little bit of, of lithium. But the point is that the hydrogen in our bodies, the hydrogen in the waters of our bodies, in our planetary homes, that hydrogen is only a few moments younger than the entire universe. It's th it's thirteen point eight billion years old. But it's been on a journey to ever greater levels of complexity. For example, uh, um, you know, with the oxygen and the other elements that were then created in stars. So we are stardust too, but the hydrogen was there from the very beginning and is there now. But I just wanted to make the point about the breath because I reframed that first moment of, of in, you know, implied chaos into a first moment of an ongoing big breath. And of course, when we look out and, and the vastness of the universe and its big breath as space has expanded and time has flowed for all those billions of years ever since, to really bring it back to our breath. Because in every moment, that big breath of our universe is breathing through our little breaths. I love that. It totally makes sense. And it's what I saw. Yes, it's what you saw. That's why I wanted to go back to it because it's what you saw. It's what you saw. And that, you know, you also saw that we're inseparable and you also saw what you, you describe as the fifth dimension. What this understanding of a meaningfully living, existing, living, loving, purposefully evolving, unitive universe and all the evidence that's supporting it is that it's also multidimensional. So on this realm, so within our universe, within its space-time, there is an arrow of time. We can sort of stand on the ground. We can enjoy uh, trees, all the, all the, all the. And we also have access to its multidimensional realms of its unitive wholeness, which is why we can have those sort of communications, both with the plants and with the plant divas, you know, the multidimensional sentience of elements and, and plants and planets and stars and angelic realms and, 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 and. So we have all of this potential when we can open ourselves up to its adventure. And that for me is fundamental to our conscious evolution. Wow, and I wanna talk about the conscious evolution just before we go there. Um, you, you talk about Gaia, our, our Earth, our planet. Um, do you believe there's other life forms on other planets and other galaxies? I would say that at this stage, but well, from my own experience directly, yes, I've been very aware of that and had a lot of communications since I was very young. But I would say now that, again, thanks to the technology, we were able to look out into space and we're able to sort of find planets out there. And a lot of those planets are similar to the planets in our solar system. We now know just from the evidence we have and the numbering we have, there are more planets in our galaxy than stars. And, they, the, and there's huge amounts of water available to those planets because when we look out to what are known as interstellar clouds of dust and, 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 and interstellar molecular clouds, they're called. Um, and there's a beautiful new image just been um, uh, issued by the James Webb Telescope of what's called the Horsehead Nebula. And there are others that you can just look and Google. These are birthing places for planetary systems. And they have within them all the abundance of stardust, all the elements, but they've gone beyond that. They have a lot of huge amounts of water ice. And they actually, we now know, have all the building blocks for biological organisms. They have the building blocks for DNA and RNA. They have the building blocks for amino acids and lipids and sugars. They're all there, but they can't then go to greater biological um, evolution because interstellar, interstellar space is not the place, it's not the home for you and I. But they, they do birth planetary systems. And from the birthing of planetary systems, and we think that happens because um, exploding stars at the end of their lives, and they're very massive, are called supernova. Those shock waves shock 
portions of those interstellar clouds into forming planetary disks. And those planetary disks, again, are not chaotic. They, they have the sort of a protostar at the middle, the center, and they have disks of, of potential planets circling them. That's how our planetary system started. And we now look out into our galaxy and there are hundreds and hundreds of millions of such planetary systems with all the building blocks to then enable that ongoing evolution of more complex biological life. It may not get to our level of complexity. It may go beyond our level of complexity. Gonna, it, yes. Yeah. But you mentioned um, the word conscious evolution. Yes. Uh, can you talk to me more about that? Because it seems that everyone at the moment is, not everybody, but there's a lot of talk about consciousness and we are yes. becoming more aware um, and, and people at various different times in their lives, some people maybe never become aware or it could be a, 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 like you at a very early age or I'm sort of feeling slowly as I get older, I'm becoming more conscious. What is con conscious evolution? It's the evolution of consciousness. It's what it says on the tin, because we talk, about, <laughs> we talk about, you know, our universe being an evolutionary universe. You know, we've just shared how it began very simply. And from that simplest of states evolved to ever greater levels of complexity with, with stars and black holes and galaxies and planets and plants and people and onward. The point is that when we look at our planetary home Gaia, She's nurtured that evolution for around 4 billion years. And so the earliest biological organisms were single-celled. They then cooperated, not competed, they cooperated to become multi-celled multi beings. So that whole journey has been a journey of collaboration. Sometimes it's been competitive, but for, ex for, for increasing complexity, it's required cooperation. It's required different levels of cooperation. And that's true now as it was 4 billion years ago. The point is that with each pulse of that evolution, there's been a, a, an increase in complexity to a point where the most complex organisms of a particular time, for various reasons, died out. But in the end of their evolutionary cycle, radical, rapid, revolutionary pulses and the next pulse of that evolution took over. So for example, 66 million years ago, an asteroid destroyed the dinosaurs, except one, one dinosaur survived, a bird. Birds are the last dinosaurs, okay? Mm -hmm. But what happened in the aftermath of that was a very, very rapid evolution of tiny little mouse-like creatures that were our ancestors, that were our mammalian ancestors. And in that 66 million years, mammals have evolved to the, to the level of diversity and abundance that exists today, and of course us. The point is, we are the last of our kind in the sense that we are the last of the homonyms. So homonyms were the were the were the were the, the evolutionary arc that came out of the journey to the great apes. But our ancestors came down from the trees and started to walk upright six and a half million years ago. There are a number of different types of them, like our Neanderthal cousins. They've all died out. We're the last ones. We will not biologically evolve. We've got to that optimum of flexibility and resilience, but our bodies per se are very unlikely to evolve as human beings, but our consciousness can, our awareness can. Do you believe we are from this planet then? Yes and no. We're 13.8 we're billion. Yeah, you know, our story is a story of our universe. So literally the whole universe and its whole story to this point is embodied in us and it's embodied in trees and it's embodied in Gaia and, and, and we're at the bow wave. You know, we're at the here and now, we're at its bow wave of its ongoing evolutionary journey. And so we, 
we have meaning and purpose in being here and now. And that's why I think conscious, our conscious evolution is so important because if we can wake up to this understanding, we can grow up. <laughs> and I guess what, what does that look like? We, we, we hear the words paradigm shift and awakening. Mm. What is that paradigm shift? I don't know. I don't know. I don't. If anybody tells you they know, I would ask the question again. And if they still say they know, I would ask it again. <laughs> <laughs> the, the reason I'm saying that is, is, again, let's go back a couple of thousand years. Two and a half thousand years ago, there was what is often seen as a paradigm shift. Because a, a paradigm is the way we see the world. Yeah. It's the story we tell, it's the narrative we, we share, and we're narrative and story sharing species. So a shift in paradigm is a shift in the way we see the world. And two and a half thousand years ago was the beginning of what's sometimes called the axial age. And that was a shift because we had great teachers over a period of time coming into incarnation. We had Lao Tzu, we had Zoroastra, we had Jesus, we had the Judaic prophets, we had um, Muhammad, we had many, many, many different teachers. And over time, that created a paradigm shift in the way that people saw the world. We had another paradigm shift driven by the scientific revolution 400 years ago. But that paradigm shift and those paradigm shifts in my perspective, were not, not anything as significant, as radical a paradigm shift that I feel we're on the threshold of now. What's different? Because it's all of us. Because it's potentially all of us. We've never been a planetary species until now. So when those teachers came forward two and a half thousand, two thousand, fifteen hundred years ago, they, they impacted their societies, and over time, that impact has spread. But we're literally now waking up as a species. And all of us, none of us is, we're all special. We're all special in that regard, and none of us are. It's, it's both the ordinariness of our humanity and the extraordinariness of our divinity coming into integration. I want to sort of ask why now, because I do, I do feel it. And, and sometimes you think, is it because, you know, you know, you're attracting in the sort of people that talk, uh, you know, like we went, we met at a conference that was about the conscious, mm -hmm. you know, conscious and human evolution. So is it because I'm just surrounding myself with those sort of people? And, you know, I'm, I'm very much exploring my intuition and various different things, but it does seem to be there is a lot of people out there that it's are huge. exploring this. Yeah, huge amount. I mean, you know, because my own journey has been this journey pretty much yeah. um, over, I'm 72 now. I started at four. You so look it's amazing. <laughs> you do not look 72 at all, Jude. <laughs> you would not have said that. Bless you, sweetheart. But it's nearly seven decades. And I've, I've really, because I'm also a, a student of history, her story. You know, I, I'm curious, you know, so I was curious. I'm curious about our journey to this point. And so I have gone back. I've gone back a very, very long way to the beginning of our universe, actually. But when I look at human history and I look at the last few thousand years and I have a PhD in archaeology. So that research was about the, 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 the paradigm shift from what's called the Mesolithic, where we're hunter gatherers, to the Neolithic, when we became farmers and pastoralists. That was a huge paradigm shift. But it, it, again, it wasn't anything as deep as what we are now and and i would say absolutely agree with you this has been a this has been an opening i think for me i, I like to go back to the early 60s yes because that you know and astrologically as well the early 60s was like another sort of pulse in this beginning of opening of awareness which of course we can go further back and further back and further back so it pulses and sometimes it pulses forward and sometimes it regresses but it's like a tide moving along the shore and now that tide is is in full spate i think it's absolutely opening and we need to because we cannot go on as we are 
It's interesting that you said the 60s. I mean, I wasn't around in the 60s, but obviously you, you read what, um, there was a bit of a psychedelic re revolution mm -hmm. in the, those times. People were becoming aware and, and it was stopped. You know, it was, yeah. uh, it, it was halted. Um, do you think we're in danger of that happening again? I think there's always that danger, but I think then it was very much the young people and the young people of the 60s who were into that never went away. They're me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the me's of that time. I mean, I was, I was what, 10 years old when the Beatles came along. You know, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and I've always been on this journey. So it, it wasn't, it just went a little, it didn't continue its full acceleration, mm. but it did change things. And it, start, and it continued to be the building blocks and those wavelets that, you know, have continued to expand. Of course, the young people coming in now, the children coming in now, in in our, in my experience, haven't lost this awareness. They're coming in with this awareness. So you know, the older the elders, you know, the elders that have gone through all of this, are here to help support. I hope the youngers coming through and everybody in between, because this is an invitation. It seems to me again from the universe to us as a species, as a planetary species, with our planetary home, our beloved Gaia. I mean, she's giving us all the imitations. But I feel like she's giving us the information as well. Absolutely. I mean, it, you know, a plant-based medicine to yes. psychedelics. Uh, I mean, it, it's almost that we have all of this at our feet. Yes. Or we have everything here. Yes. If we choose, if we choose to open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts, open our hearts because we've moved into our heads so much and and you know now there's such an opportunity to open our hearts and you know there was there was something came forward about 25 years ago called interspirituality and this was some teachings of folks who realized that the deepest wisdom across all the religions and all the faith-based teachings was the same message the message of love and so the, the understand you know bringing all that together in these these tenets these principles of interspirituality which is the golden rule and and others also you know now 25 years on things have worsened in many ways and yet this underlying tidal shift almost beneath the surface has been building and growing and growing and now it's almost not it's not despite of where we're at which is unsustainable it's because it is unsustainable that i feel that the push the, the push and the pull you know of the con of, of our evolving consciously we're being pushed and we're being pulled wow um i guess that that would sort of lead on to me saying well what happened or in obviously you so you don't know but what is your belief happens when we when we die in my experience having spoken with a lot of dead folks my experience is our consciousness continues now it may not continue um i mean our universe is finite we are microcosms of its finiteness but it's a finite thought sonia in an infinite and eternal cosmos so just because our universe is finite Maybe, you know, 13.8 billion years ago, it came into being. Maybe in another 10 billion, it will come to the end of its life cycle, because it is a life cycle. That's still, what, 23, 25 billion years. That's a long time. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. But it's, not in, it, but it's not infinity, and it's not eternity. Now, that's interesting, because I, I guess we presume that the universe was, was, in, in, was well, infinity. But you're saying, there really, well, there will be an end point. To our universe, yes, that's the best evidence we have. I mean, we know it began a finite time ago. Nothing within space time is infinite, nothing. And yet we are nurtured as a finite thought form in the infinite mind of the cosmos. For me, that's an incredibly beautiful vision. And it's what all the evidence is saying, but it's also what the ancient wisdom teachings also speak to. Certainly the ones that really explored, you know, the nature of reality at these mm -hmm. deepest levels. 
that's the wisdom they bequeathed to us. And that's the wisdom we're rediscovering in very different ways. So, and honoring. so then why are we here? If our universe meaningfully exists to purposefully evolve, then our universe has evolved its complexity from its initial simplicity to very complex beings we call humans mm. and very complex planetary homes we call Gaia. Yeah, Able to nurture that biological complexity and beings able to be cell, you know, be individuated microcosmic expressions of universal reality. And this is what we are, you know. Um, there's so many things that I've just sort of had sort of aha moments when you said that. And I thought about our bodies. Um, and you said, you know, our minds, uh, well, our bodies will eventually, I guess, we'll, we'll, as, as a consciousness, our minds will go ahead, but our bodies won't. Um, oh. And, you know, uh, one of my big things is I'm very much into my health and fitness and biohacking and all the rest of it. Um, and I sort of see, I, I see a future when our bodies will no longer be the bodies that we look at and we see today. That may be. We've got so many choices, Sonia, in terms of how we move forward. I mean, for me, I probably won't be around by then, and I'm very happy to to move on to new adventures. But for me, we we're hardly we're hardly accessing our capacities at the moment, and I don't mean biological capacities. I mean conscious capacities. You know, our our abilities to have supernormal experiences naturally you know i have conversations with with or with anybody but i'll, I'll yeah, whether they're incarnate or discarnate whether they're a plant or an animal or a person or an angel or a diva or an ancestor or whatever or a planetary home you know because that's been my experience all my life but you've had that experience through plant medicine and that incredible wisdom that gaia has shown you through plant medicine and that's just beginning, I would suggest, to open you up mm, to, these, to these even greater vistas of possibility. I'd, I'd love to know, and, and I guess if, some, if people are listening, well, how do they tap into this more? How do they um, tap into their superpowers more? What, what, is there any sort of suggestions? Keep on keeping on. I mean, you know, I, 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 we, what we were saying earlier, you know, it's, it's supposed to have been open to it you know, being open to the possibility of this. Then when we're open to the possibility, in my experience, the universe offers us opportunities to play. Yeah. And that might be a synchronicity. Oh, back to intuition. Synchronicity. We're back to intuition. I synchronicity. Love I love it. Let, let, just quickly on, on synchronicities, because mm. there's a lot of people that, that say, oh, I don't believe in coincidences, I guess is a sort of another word for synchronicity. Uh, and I, and I always, I just, it's just so, to me, it's so, so obvious, I guess, that these are signs yeah. that, that you can't avoid uh, or, or you can avoid. In fact, a lot of people do avoid. Um, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to use the word should, because we've already mentioned that, mm -hmm. but how do we spot these or, and, and, and what could we do? Well, first of all, I think you just said it. If people are unwilling to be open to the possibility of these, then you you walk past. You you will ignore or you will deny or you won't even see that sort of sign. And when people say, I don't believe in them, why don't you believe in them? And I would suggest that a lack of belief is very allied to what we're taught and our societies tell us that our universe is meaningless. It's purposelessness. It's purposeless. It's, it, you know, that the evolution is a series of random mutations, accidental. None of that is true. None of that is true. And we have the evidence instead that our universe meaningfully exists, as I mentioned earlier, to purposefully evolve from simplicity to complexity as a unitive entity, a multidimensional unitive entity, a great thought where mind and consciousness are what we in the whole world are but if you don't if you're taught the old 
paradigm, which we all are, or have been, of materialism and separation, there's no place for synchronicities. There's no place for intuition. When we turn that completely on its head, which we have the evidence for now, huge amounts of evidence for now, every scale, then we can enter a new understanding. This is what the paradigm shift is. We can start, we can wake up and realize we're inseparable, we're un unique, but we're also part of the, the unity and diversity of our universe. But, but in this understanding, meaningful coincidences, not everything, we can trip over ourselves and say, everything, everything, everything. <laughs> Yeah, I had a, a dear friend of mine who takes, you know, takes her vitamins in the mornings. Uh, one morning, she sort of just she had a, a start and sort of the, the, the vitamins all flew out of the box. So she spent the entire day asking herself, why did that happen? Why did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's a, there's a balance to be, you know, there's a balance here and you can play that balance wherever you feel comfortable with. But what this understanding shows us is that the meaningful synchronicities are a natural attribute of a unitive conscious universe and our intuition is our natural superpower and when those two are combined as you know in your own experience life's wonderful it's an adventure it has its ups and downs of course it does but you know it, it is it's just so richer so much richer and I think we've become, or a lot of people have become really desperate and searching for that purpose. Uh, I think a lot of the time, and I'm just going to say that it can be linked to materialistic things. It's always yeah. got to be, okay, I've got to, I've got to discover the next big business or what's the next big idea that's going to make me a lot of money or, you know, how am I going to do? Uh, and purpose doesn't have to be that. No, it doesn't. And I would suggest beyond that, that our very existence is purposeful. Just being here is purposeful. Our universe embodies purpose, its purpose in us. So when we actually come into that state of being purposeful rather than doing purposeful, it, it relaxes us into that invitation of the universe to experience, to explore. I to love, I, I'm, I'm loving this because I, I'm, I, I've am i been on a bit of a quest to find my purpose. <laughs> and I've got a lot of people going, you're just a human doing, <laughs> you just need to do a bit of being. Okay. And certainly what came out from my experience um, was that we are here to experience love and connect. And that, and that those, that was, it was a, simple almost as that. yes and the, the doing will come but rather than the doing it's the being it's it's how we are within ourselves in our relationships with the world it's from that beingness that the doingness can flow and in my experience when that happens our doingness is is becoming of service to the good of the whole rather than the sort of the more money for me more this for me more that for me because we transcend we, we step by step transcend that tightness to our ego and we can relax into it. It's still there. It's part of our earth walk, but we can relax more into it. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Jude, where can people find out firstly more about you and, and the multitude? You've got some amazing books. Now, I picked up the eighth chakra. I don't know if you remember which again was quite meaningful for me at the time um i was exploring the number eight because i was seeing yeah. eights everywhere <laughs> um, um and you and you the most recent book was the story of gaia do you have any other books on the cards uh well i've written seven books um and um and there's another book i hope on the cards because the cosmic hologram the story of gaia were books one and two of a trilogy so there's a third book I hope to be in. The Eighth Chakra, I think for you, really, I, I hope you enjoyed it because what that is showing is as we consciously evolve, we literally expand our awareness beyond the seven chakras, which is where our sort of ego experience and sense of self is embodied and plays out into what was then I called the Eighth Chakra, but I now call the Universal Heart the same thing, but it's opening ourselves to this awareness and opening from, you know, the universal heart and the bridge between the me and the we and the all. So people can find me 
at www.wholeworld-view.org. And there's lots of stuff on there, lots of resources and and uh, an invitation to join our free newsletter, quarterly newsletter. All things I, unitive. <laughs> I, I absolutely love the work that you do. Um, finally, what important um, message have we not discussed that you would like to share? We've discussed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I think yeah. I would like to sort of suggest, not necessarily discussing it, but something when people ask, what is the one thing I would invite people to do in their lives? And I reply, choose love. What a lovely place to end. Jude, thank you so much for being a wonderful guest on my show. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you so much. <laughs>